grateful for you all to be here. I uh, never quite know what to expect. A man who lived 97 years and uh, commented often that all of his friends died around him. You know, he out survived all of them. I'm going to say a few things uh, that I'm sure uh, will come from a faulty memory, but uh, they're my memories, and so I just want to fly over a little bit of his life. Some of the things you already see in his obituary. But uh, James, or Jim, or Dad, or Grandpa, or J.O. Jim, was born in Itawamba County, Mississippi. Itawamba shared its eastern border with Alabama, and so his upbringing is really kind of in between Mississippi and Alabama. I at times called him Grandpa, as I did for most of the time I knew him, not because he was my Grandpa, but because that's how many knew him. Because he was Grandpa to many, and that wisdom of the ages is what we expect from Grandpa's was inherent in him. He was truly a man who epitomized the greatest generation, and while it's easy to put him in that category because he knew the value of hard work, as a farm boy in Alabama, being raised in a home that lacked electricity or central heating, enduring the Great Depression, sacrificed the country in World War II, and devotion to his wife and family, I think he deserves it because of his open and unapologetic devotion to Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. But we'll get into that more later. His family were tenant farmers in general, but his dad had several vocations while Jim grew up, including time as a barber and even later as the sheriff in the locale. I'm not sure his relationship with his dad was ever described as warm, nor did I ever get the impression he was close to his mom, but I'm not sure if that was just part and parcel of the era in which he grew up, where kids had roles to play on the farm, and there wasn't much time for the kind of fathering I know I wanted to have with my boys, outwardly expressing love to them, nurturing their studies or hobbies, and comforting them when they got boo-boos. No. Their relationship seemed very utilitarian to me, but that was a style that Grandpa would not repeat as he parented his girls. More on that later. Jim grew into his teen years and World War II broke out when he was 15 years old. In 1944, at 17, he was eager to do his part and wanted to enlist. There was a college program the Army had at the University of Florida called the Army Specialized Training Program. Jim got his parents to sign the waiver that would let him apply at 17. Shipped off to Gainesville to begin the program but perhaps because signs of weakness in the Axis forces were beginning to show or the Army's needs changed as the war progressed, the program was canceled and Jim was sent back to enter boot camp. He wanted to join the Army Air Corps to realize his lifelong passion for flight, but ended up in the infantry. This was not how Jim thought he'd give service to the Allied forces, but in God's sovereign providence, it had to be the right call. Because who knows if he had survived as an aviator but God. When he finished basic training, he was shipped off to France, then Germany, as the Browning machine gun operator in a platoon whose main focus was to secure or defend assets the Germans had left behind on their retreat. Jim wasn't a guy who looked in the rearview mirror. His daughters knew he was in the war and had been injured, but that was about it. He didn't speak of it, I think, in part not just because there was pain in speaking of it, but I think he also saw no purpose in speaking of it, either to romanticize it or lament over it. It's not his way. He recalled how members of his platoon, when injured, would cry out, medic, medic. And in those moments, he said to himself, if I ever get injured, I'm not going to be one of those guys. <laughs> well, this determination was put to a test when his platoon had been called to defend a bridge the Germans had supposedly left behind. So his group of about 30 approached the town adjacent to the bridge to discover that not only had the Germans not left yet, but there was a battalion of about 300 there to greet them. The platoon leader called the retreat, and Jim was asked to give cover fire for their escape. As he rose to be the last man to get in their truck, something exploded. He wasn't sure if it was a mine he stepped on or a grenade that landed near him or a mortar round that close by, but the inside of his upper left arm was shredded. Did he cry medic? No. He got on the truck, and as they drove away to safety, he applied his own tourniquet and waited until he got back to base to seek professional medical help. He was shipped off to Paris and London, then to Daytona Beach in Florida for treatment. He went back to the family farm after the war. By the way, his arm pretty much fully recovered. Another story on that, maybe at the house. <laughs> he went back to the family farm after the war, but hoped to head off to college. His desire for higher education was not encouraged by his parents. In fact, it was discouraged, saying he shouldn't get above his raisin. But off he went anyway to the University of Houston and obtained a degree in mechanical engineering and applied sciences and a certificate in air conditioning and refrigeration. This got him a job at what later became Rockwell International and later to be assumed under the Boeing name. This job was in Southern California. It was there he married, and for reasons outside of his control, that marriage did not last. So in his early 30s, he was single again and a fairly hot property among the ladies at Rockwell. 
you've seen some of those pictures. <laughs> he caught the eye of Barbara Mackey, and they married at her parents' home in Escondido, California, in 1961. The lovely Lisa was born in 1963, and the beautiful younger sister, Erin, in November of 66. Jim was a mega devoted father, spending time with his family whenever he had it and passing on job changes that might cut into that time, even if those job changes meant more money. Passing up on moving to wealthier areas, to nicer homes, knowing those moves would likely demand he'd take those more lucrative jobs and therefore demand more time away from his family. I originally put his girls were not athletes, but they were, they reminded me, they were gymnasts, but they weren't at events where, <laughs> I don't mean to be dismissive about that, but <laughs> the places where they were athletes didn't have cheerleaders. And the point I bring up is that they were cheerleaders also. <laughs> and Jim would go to these games, these baseball and football, which you were not baseball players or football players, and he would be there to support them as cheerleaders and their boyfriends and friends. And in fact, one season, there was South High School had a very, uh, a very good baseball team. And they, they became, he became known as their good luck charm because every game he was at, they won. The only game he missed, they lost. Aww. He was active in church life, becoming a trustee at Rolling Hills Covenant Church on the Palos Verdes Peninsula in Southern California. He taught Sunday school, and the Clanton family made church an integral part of their lives. Aaron and Lisa became fixtures in music ministry at church and in youth group life, and Jim and Barbara actively supported this engagement. Jim worked on the F-100, the B-70, XB-70, YB-70, Saturn V, and more, but the bulk of his time at Rockwell was working on the B-1 bomber, which later became the B-1B. Aaron and I married in January of 88, at least later in 89, but retirement beyond those events meant he and Barbara traveled, and they did. Mostly in the U.S. on driving trips, but some cruises on rivers and elsewhere, with New Orleans as their favorite destination. The first Granberry came with the birth of our son, Jake. In 1993, and Jim was, of course, a grandfather supreme. Life was good, and Jim knew he was blessed. A wrinkle in life came when Barbara was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1994, and Jim, of course, was a doting supporter and caregiver as she underwent a mastectomy and drug therapy. This course of treatment seemed to work, and they continued their travels, perhaps at a slightly slower pace. 1997 brought two more grandbabies in short succession, Caitlin in February and Sam a week later in March. The blessings continued. Then the brokenness of the world returned to rear its ugly head, and a routine follow-up revealed Barbara's breast cancer had come back to bone cancer in 1998. In January of 99, his beloved Barbara passed. It was in her dying days, almost 25 years ago, that she predicted Jim would live to be 97 years old. She was right. He had his 97th birthday this last April. Jim's post-Barbara life had more travel with the friends that he and Barbara had previously traveled with, but his greatest role in this season was as a fill-in dad for his granddaughter. In 2006, Aaron and I came to Jim when we were pondering him a job with Ligonier, which would mean a move to Florida. And we wanted to get his thoughts and hopefully his blessing. He knew his small and tight-knit family would now be separated by 3,000 miles, and there would be pain in that. But he simply said, you have to do what's best for your family. That was his way, fostering independence in spite of how he might feel about it personally, so we moved. He visited frequently and would often help us visit the West Coast. And in 2011, I talked to him about, about being my roommate on the Ligonier study tour of the Holy Land. He was 85 years old on this trip. And when we returned, he had two notes. <clears throat> One, if he had known how much walking there would be on the trip, he never would have agreed to go. <laughs> two, it was the greatest trip of his lifetime. We had the joy and privilege of spending close and extended time with R.C. Sproul and his lovely wife, Festa. Since I was a video guy, and we got there early to record RC in relevant locations, and we stayed late for similar reasons. So we traveled as part of the Sproul contingency. RC was later to call Jim his favorite rock and scientist. And that was a badge Jim cherished. When it came to his theology, Jim would say he liked RC and could probably agree on just about everything he said. As Jim pottered his waning years, it appeared it made most sense for him to come to Florida and move in with us to aid in his inevitable aging season. So in March of 2016, he became our roommate. The first few years at our house, he was as active as he could be, helping me landscape our new backyard, pulling out a shovel to smooth and rake as much as he could, tossing down sod when it came, regularly skimming the pool, etc. COVID came in early in 2020, and as we all know, as we all know it came, and his ear, nose, and throat doc told him he should probably stay out of the public for a couple of months, a directive which he honored. But then as the lockdown waned and he longed for his cherished spicy shrimp with sauce on the side and raspberry Cosmo at Ruth's Chris Happy Hour, 
He said enough, and he was not going to be allowed his final days to be spent in some sort of house arrest. So about May of 2020, the restaurant regularity resumed. A couple nights a week, maybe more. I think it was later in 2020 that he took a fall, and it was becoming clear that he was losing steadiness on his feet. So we felt like we couldn't leave him alone. It was then we started to hire care workers to be with him during the day, as Aaron and I went to work. That cost was onerous. And while God had pro provided his savings in his 401k for just this kind of purpose, we looked at an assisted care option where the insurance he had for such a need could actually extend the value of his savings. So in June of 2021, we checked him at the Atria in Sanford. That place has since changed names, but he had avoided getting the COVID shot because he'd had an allergic reaction to the flu shot some years earlier. And so he was told not to get one, but Atria demanded it. So we talked to his doctors and they needed a COVID shot to move in and he got it. The Atria stay started out rough after they quarantined him because the COVID shot was so new on him. But then he settled into the social life at the facility and was making friends. But a month into his stay, he got COVID. I remember bringing him home to our house for dinner, not knowing he had been exposed. And during that drive, I believe he gave it to me, then I to Aaron. The details of how he ended up in the hospital aren't worth digging into, but what's clear is that he beat it. In spite of the doctors at Advent Health telling us we should assume he would not make it and start to make our preparations. They were playing the odds. A 95-year-old dude with mild COPD was very likely to die of COVID, but they didn't know Jim. He spent 11 days in the hospital, then moved back in with us, swearing never to go back to a facility again. This was our next chapter with 24-7 care at a home for him. We were blessed in large part to have women, some of them are here right now, to love on him and, and treat him as if they were his own dad. He knew it and loved them back as much as he could. The season of discomfort was tough for Jim, and I say discomfort because he was largely without pain, but his existence was not comfortable. And his dignity greatly diminished as he had to rely on these girls for so many basic needs. He wondered aloud why God would sustain him in this way. But it wasn't difficult to find a purpose for Jim in this season. Nicole, for example, when COVID hit, had found it difficult to find work since she was reluctant to get the, the COVID shot but she also needed the income to help support her family. She told us openly how God put this job in her life at the perfect moment. Jim was a testimony to Nicole and all of them, I hope, showing Jesus, Jesus even in this phase of life. So the way God had provided for Jim in his life meant he could provide for multiple families as his health declined and not, a financial, not be a financial burden to us, which was a huge blessing. He also shared his faith openly. And we gave away several Bibles, Reformation study Bibles, to care workers over the last two and a half years. The Bible paints a picture for us as God the Father, and in doing so makes some assumptions about fathers being good. It's a tough analogy for some who don't have great dads. I love my dad, and he loved me, but he didn't really know how to be a good dad. I was sad to be at my dad's funeral. The thing he was most remembered for was his great laugh and wonderful voice. I truly hope that is not all I am remembered for. And it is not what Jim will be remembered for. Jim was a good father. Good, good father. Not perfect, but pretty close. He's the kind of father that helps the biblical analogy make sense. He was faithful, funny, smart, compassionate, full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and gentleness, and more wonderful fruits of the spirit descriptives. I can credit to him in good conscience. Biblical analogy goes further to speak of believers as those adopted, grafted into God's family. And Jim grafted me into his family. See me not just as son-in-law, but as his son. And oftentimes, both of us would not feel comfortable saying in-law. I was his son, and he called me such. I've said many times, I think he read his Bible more than anyone I know. And I know a lot of professional theologians. But he would read it cover to cover every year of his retirement which was decades long before it became too difficult for him to see his Bible. And I'm confident this regular reading did not begin at 60 years old. But he also knew his goodness was not why we can be confident he is now in heaven, enjoying fellowship with his creator. He is there only because of the goodness of God, of Jesus. The saving work on the cross and subsequent resurrection. Jim knew that. Jim's goodness was an outward display of his inward faith in God. 
Ever since December of 22, Jim had been mostly bedbound the last nine months or so, and his cognition remained mostly intact until just about a month or two ago. But even up to a few weeks ago, he'd have smatterings of coherency, and we'd see his old self show up. There's much more that could be said of a life of 97 years, but I'll close with this. And Pastor Jim will get more into the biblical weeds than I will, but know that Jim Clanton would want to make sure if there was anything that came out of his memorial, his celebration of life, would be that you must know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. The Jesus of the Bible. For that Jesus is very different than the Jesus Islam acknowledges, for example, or the Jews recognize, or Mormons, or the world. For the world paints a picture of Jesus hanging out with sinners, which he did do. But in every case, he said, stop sinning. To speak of sin demands we know what sin is, and the Bible tells us. So it all rolls into one big package. Knowing Jesus means knowing what Jesus cares about. And the words his father gave us in the Bible are our rule of faith and practice. Honor him today by searching your heart to see if God has opened it for you to know him. That is the best silver lining this day could have.